Good evening and welcome. It is time once again for CU Immigration here on WRFU LP Urbana, 104.5 FM and UPTV. I will be your host for this evening. My name is Mr. Garza and I am here to let you know that WRFU is an open forum for the Urbana Champaign community. Views expressed are those of the speakers and are not intended to represent WRFU, UCIMC, or UPTV. These views are our own, and by our in this instance, I mean myself and or anyone whose views I happen to be reading in a story uh, or information article that I share with you today. Uh, I'm going to begin. This is another post-election show. Um, but there's still a lot of ongoing things that uh, have yet to be resolved from the last four years. And in this story, we have an article entitled Border Patrol Settles Lawsuit with U.S. Citizens Detained After an Agent Heard Them Speaking Spanish. Two American citizens have reached a settlement in a lawsuit they filed against U.S. Custom and Border Protection after an agent asked them for IDs because he heard them speaking Spanish. Ana Suda and Martha Mimi Hernandez, who live in the small town of Avre, Montana, said they were detained by a Border Patrol agent while waiting to pay for groceries at a local convenience store in May 2018. The agent, Paul O'Neill, approached them, commented on their accent, and asked where they were born, according to the ACLU. When they responded, Suda is from Texas and Hernandez is from California. He asked to see identification and questioned them for 40 minutes, they say. O'Neill eventually returned their licenses and told them they could go. The lawsuit, filed in 2019, claims O'Neill violated the Fourth Amendment, which prohibits unreasonable searches and the women's right to equal protection. The settlement involves a monetary sum, the ACLU said. We stood up to the government because speaking Spanish is not a reason to be racially profiled and harassed. I am proud to be bilingual, and I hope that as a result of this case, CBP takes a hard look at its policies and practices, Suda said in a statement. No one else should ever have to go through this again. In a statement to CNN, Border Patrol said the agents are trained to enforce laws uniformly and fairly, without discrimination based on religion, race, ethnicity, or sexual orientation. CBC stresses honor and integrity in every aspect of our mission, and the overwhelming majority of CBP employees and officers perform their duties with honor and distinction, working tirelessly every day to keep our country safe, the agency said. Boy, that sounds like a commercial, doesn't it? Suda, who recorded the incident on her cell phone, is shown in the video asking the agent why he questioned them. Ma'am, the reason I asked for your IDs is because I came in here and saw that you guys were speaking Spanish, which is very unheard of up here, he responds. The area is about 35 miles south of the U.S.-Canada border. Suda then asks if she and her friend are being racially profiled. It has nothing to do with that, the agent replies. It has to do with the fact that you were speaking Spanish in the store in a state that is predominantly English-speaking. About 4% of Avre residents are Hispanic or Latino, according to the U.S. Census. About 1.4% speak a language other than English at home. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I'll let that speak for itself. So, <clears throat> moving onward, we have Biden's Day One Challenges, the Immigration Reset. This is going to be a tough one. Uh, as anyone who's watched this show regularly is, is very much aware of all of the different ways, the many myriad ways that Trump and his, his gang have uh, sought to influence, to change, uh, and to basically recreate our immigration policies from one end to the other. Uh, everything from the front line of people who who interact with immigrants themselves to all of the various agencies and uh, bureaucracy that, that handles the paperwork. Everything. Everything has been affected in some way. This has been the number one project of, of this administration for the last four years, and it's going to take a lot of work to change it. So let's hear 
some of what these people have to say about that. So this says, President-elect Biden has an aggressive day one immigration agenda that relies heavily on executive actions to undo President Trump's crackdown. It's not that easy. Trump issued more than 400 executive actions on immigration, and advocates are fired up. The Supreme Court could threaten the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, and experts warn there could be another surge at the border. On his first day, Biden has said he will rescind Trump's Muslim ban through executive action and send legislation to Congress with a pathway to citizenship for the nearly 11 million undocumented immigrants. Biden is expected to use executive action to bolster DACA even as the courts consider its validity. It's unclear whether he will expand protections for more immigrants or add benefits. He'll pause deportations for the first hundred days, stop border wall construction, and create a task force to reunite immigrant families. Biden will, quote, work to ensure our immigration policies are reflective of our American values, end quote, says Jennifer Molina, a spokesperson for the Biden transition team. Even so, it will be difficult for Biden to undo many of the policies Trump pushed through uphold immigration law and pacify progressive Democrats and the immigration advocacy community, who will be far more critical of anything Biden does than during Barack Obama's presidency. Biden has promised to end Trump's Remain in Mexico policy, which forced tens of thousands of asylum seekers from all over to wait for their court dates in Mexico. But undoing all of Trump's strict border policies too quickly could leave the U.S. unprepared for a spike of migrants at the border. To mitigate large migrant flows to the border, the Biden administration is expected to invest in refugee programs in Central American countries. Biden also will be under pressure to let in more refugees from around the world after Trump cut the number of refugees allowed into the U.S. by 80%. Biden has notably not said he will end the Center for Disease Control and Prevention Coronavirus-Related Emergency Order, which has let officials almost immediately expel nearly 60,000 migrants at the border. Temporarily leaving the order in place could help maintain some order when Remain in Mexico is ended, several immigration experts said. Border crossings are already starting to rise. Leon Fresco, an immigration attorney who worked at the Justice Department under Obama, said it's pretty likely that Biden will have to deal with a surge at the border as soon as next summer. Biden would want to avoid scenes of detained children and families that scarred both Obama and Trump, but he must keep order. On DACA, Biden can easily restore the program by executive action for now, but immigration advocates and experts are watching a Texas lawsuit challenging DACA's legality. What DACA recipients deserve is Congress to pass a pathway to citizenship immediately in the near year, said Todd Schulte, president of FWD.US, a leading advocate of immigration reform. It's a tall order for a likely divided Congress, especially after four years of Trump's immigration crackdown that was widely popular within the Republican Party. Republican. At DHS, once confirmed, Alejandro Mayorkas, a favorite among advocates, will have to reshape one of the most politicized agencies under Trump. He will need leaders on board at the immigration-focused sub-agencies of Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, Customs and Border Protection, and U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. Any permanent leaders will need to be confirmed by the Senate. ICE has become one of the most contentious agencies for its role in arresting and detaining immigrants. Biden will likely reset priorities so agents focus arrests on immigrants with no serious criminal records, as under Obama. I'm sorry. Biden will likely reset priorities so agents focus arrests on immigrants with serious criminal records, as under Obama. I must have been thinking of Trump. But John Sandwig, who ran ICE under Obama, said Biden will have a legal duty to faithfully execute the laws, and there's still going to be a big disconnect between who the advocates think should be arrested and the size of the agency and legal requirements. So, yeah, I'm hoping, you know, this this is probably, I don't know, probably me being optimistic. Uh, 
unduly optimistic, let's say. But I'm hoping that people will understand the magnitude of the problem that uh, President-elect Biden is going to face. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Trump has spent the last four years uh, just attacking immigration, legal and otherwise, in every possible way, trying to limit it, uh, halt it, uh, alter who gets let in, uh, change standards, change processes, change uh, fees, <laughs> everything. And um, on one hand, that's going to be difficult, just simply the magnitude. You have four years of constant attempts to change things. You can't immediately, I mean, it's not like President Biden can come in and say, okay, everything that Trump did is null and void. It's gone. He can do that with a lot of the executive order type things. That's relatively easy in comparison. But uh, as far as the the changes in, in processes by how immigrants are, uh, you know, the, the, the kinds of paperwork they have to do, the sorts of fees they have to pay, all that sort of thing is going to be a very tangled mess that's going to be difficult to untangle. And um, the politicization, politiz politicization, 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 boy, that's not easy for me. Uh, the politicization of organizations like ICE and, and DHS and all those things, a lot of people have been hired, a lot of practices have been put in place. Um, a lot of people who were already working there have been emboldened to behave in different ways. All, all, all that doesn't just seize the moment uh, there are new directives from the top. Some of that is going to go on and going to have to be ferreted out bit by bit over time. So you're still going to have uh, agents who are you know, overzealous and who cheat and bend the rules and, and do all sorts of things in order to uh, find, identify, and remove immigrants, regardless of how dangerous or whatever they may be in using the existing terminology. And uh, that's just, it's not going to be easy to say, I mean, you can issue a directive, stop doing things like that. But, you know, people will continue to do what they want to do until somebody specifically stops them and says, Tom, you can't do that anymore. Um, you know, then then I stop. But until then, I'm still going to go, oh, well, here's my chance to get rid of these guys and to do this. And, uh, you know, it, it's just it's going to take a long time. And I hope people understand that simply by being the new sheriff in town, so to speak, you don't suddenly just wave a magic wand and change everything. And as that last article mentioned, you know, Biden is still bound by the existing laws, some of which are awful and, and need to be changed. But that is a whole different process, and that requires cooperation from a lot of people who have no reason to want to cooperate, basically. Uh, so I, I just really hope that, I mean, this is kind of hard to say because Obama deported a lot of people and I, I was around during that time doing this kind of work during that time. And I remember a lot of people had very negative anti-Obama feelings about what he was up to. And... I can recall just feeling like, well, you know, you're not being reasonable here about some of this stuff. Some of this, yes, he should be called to account for it, but some of it is baked into the system itself. And he can't necessarily, simply by issuing directives, change that. Um, so I, I felt in a 
in some ways, I won't say a lot of ways, but in some ways that Obama was unfairly targeted by immigration activists uh, because of some of the policies that existed during his tenure. But I don't think that they could necessarily have been ascribed to him. So it wasn't like he was saying, I want immigration to be, you know, done this way. And then secretly going back and going, ah, forget that I said that. Let's really do it this way. I don't think that's how it worked. And um, I'm hoping that that if there is a similar disconnect between the presidential proclamations and the actual events on the ground, people aren't going to just assume, although I'm, I know even as I say it that there are a few people <laughs> that will definitely do that, uh, that they won't just assume that, that Biden's up to some sneaky uh, backdoor business and, and realize that it's just it's a huge and complicated situation. And you just can't solve it quickly or easily. Like even if if Biden were somehow King Biden, <laughs> you know, he comes in and it's not president, but he's king and he can just decree things on pain of death. It's such a complicated situation. And it's so easy to take uh, individual events and say, look, here's an example of what's going on. And uh, create this sense, I guess you might say, that some sneaky, awful things are afoot, you know. Uh, and so just as I tried throughout the last four years to, to rely primarily on what Trump said, his administration said, and what they actually did, like, here's my intention. Here's what I'm doing. You know, I tried to rely on that for my critiques about their immigration policy rather than uh, looking at individual events and, and say, oh, well, this means that X is going on. You can always read into things what you want to find there if you try hard enough. And so I guess what I'm just saying is that it's important to you know, stand back and look at the bigger picture if you want to understand what someone is doing or trying to do. And uh, I guess I don't know who I'm directing this to. I'm just saying it because it comes to mind. Anyway, I should just I should continue here. Uh, the next story is entitled Trump's bid to exclude undocumented immigrants from reapportionment arrives at the Supreme Court. <clears throat> President Trump will swing for the fences in his last immigration legal battle at the Supreme Court where he claims authority for the first time in the nation's history to exclude undocumented residents when deciding the size of each state's congressional delegation. Opponents of his plan say it is foreclosed by more than 200 years of practice, the text of the Constitution, and the authority granted the President by Congress. Three lower courts have ruled against Trump and a fourth said the time is not ripe for a decision on the question's merits. But the president's lawyers will tell the Supreme Court on Monday that it is up to the president to decide whether undocumented immigrants should be counted, a decision that could have far-reaching implication for a state's representation in Congress and power in the Electoral College and for billions of dollars in federal funds. The president need not treat all illegal aliens as inhabitants of the states and thereby allow their defiance of federal law to distort the allocation of the people's representatives, Acting Solicitor General Jeffrey B. Wall wrote in the government's brief to the court. To the contrary, that an alien lacks permission to be in this country and may be subject to removal is relevant to whether he has sufficient ties to a state to rank among its inhabitants. Trump's approach could shift congressional seats from states with large immigrant populations, such as California, and spare some rural and Republican areas, such as Alabama, expected to lose a member of Congress. Trump's immigration policy initiatives have tested the Supreme Court before. In 2018, the court ruled 5-4 to four that the president had authority to bar some immigrants from mostly Muslim countries. 
last year by the same count, it said his administration had not followed proper procedures in trying to add a citizenship question to the census form. Trump's opponents say his reapportionment intentions announced in a July memorandum are an extension of that. Legally, they say, his plan is directly contradicted by the Constitution's requirement to base apportionment of the House of Representatives on, quote, the whole number of persons in each state, end quote, as determined by the once-a-decade census. The whole number of persons in each state. That seems pretty definitive to me. But anyway, the constitutional mandates mean undocumented immigrants are in Included in that whole number, argues New York, one of the states challenging Trump intentions. The inclusion was the result of a clear choice to provide representation in the House to all persons affected and served by the federal government, and not only to citizens or voters, New York Attorney General Letitia James says in the state's brief. The presidential memorandum at issue here defies these unambiguous mandates and breaks with more than 200 years of history. Trump's memorandum indicated he believed that some states would be getting more congressional seats than deserved. California was implied, but not named, because of their numbers of undocumented residents. He directed Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross to provide him with two sets of numbers, one that includes unauthorized immigrants and one that does not, to the maximum extent feasible and consistent with the discretion delegated to the executive branch. It remains unclear how Ross may attempt to do this. Without a citizenship question on the census form, and with no conclusive tallies in existence indicating how many undocumented people live in each state. Dale Ho, a lawyer for the American Civil Liberties Union, who is among those who will argue at the court Monday, said the president is trying to weaponize the census and that his power to direct the count does not stretch so far. It's right that the president has broad discretion, but it has never been held that the president has discretion to subtract people from the total numbers, Ho said. The special three-member court decision under review by the Supreme Court said Trump's memorandum was an unlawful exercise of the authority granted to him by Congress and that the question was not particularly close or complicated. But the decision also gives the Supreme Court a way out if justices don't want to make such an important decision before the end of the year. It said the states and organizations challenging the president's memorandum had legal standing only because it might chill participation in the census by immigrant groups. Now that the census has been completed, the government argues, the rationale no longer applies. It says the Supreme Court should simply vacate the opinions of the lower courts and wait to see if the Census Bureau can even come up with the numbers the president has requested and whether they make any difference in reapportionment. <clears throat> Excuse me. But Thomas Wolfe, senior counsel at the Brennan Center for Justice at New York University School of Law, said that if the Supreme Court delays a decision, a bad actor is liberated to test the limits of our apportionment system that has never been disrespected or abused in the manner that the president is proposing. I apologize for my neighbor's dog who... Very noisy. <laughs> and right outside my window. <clears throat> there are big questions about whether and how the president can realistically exclude undocumented immigrants from state population totals, even if the justices were to agree he has the authority. The government has not explained how it plans to identify and count undocumented immigrants. An estimated 10.5 million to 12 million live in the United States, but the law requires that apportionment numbers be based on an actual enumeration of people living in a state, not estimates, and no comprehensive list of undocumented immigrants exists. Attempts to count them could involve subtracting citizens and legally documented non-citizens, such as refugees, people with student or work visas, and green card holders, from the total population count. But that could miss others who are authorized to be in the United States, such as people protected by the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, or those who have applied for asylum. Government officials have suggested they will use lists of people in Immigration and Customs Enforcement detention on April 1st, Census Day, 
but that is a fraction of the total, and would likely not be enough people to change the apportionment of house seats. Another barrier is time. Delays caused by the coronavirus pandemic put the census several months behind schedule. The government initially requested that Congress approve a four-month delay to the December 31st, 1st, <laughs> sorry, the government initially requested that Congress approve a fourth, four-month delay to the December 31st statutory deadline to deliver state population counts for apportionment. But after Trump issued his memo, the Bureau changed course and said it would deliver the numbers by that date after all, compressing the six months it had planned for post-count data analysis to around two and a half months. In mid-November, however, Bureau staffers told Commerce Department officials the state population counts would not be ready until late January or February, after Trump is scheduled to leave office, according to people familiar with the discussions who, like others, spoke on the condition of anonymity due to the matter's ongoing sensitivity. It is unclear how much additional time it would take to give the president a second set of numbers reflecting a count of undocumented immigrants. The Census Bureau has not confirmed that the estimated delivery date has changed. Its director, Steve Dillingham, issued a statement saying certain processing anomalies have been discovered during post-count analysis. Some of the anomalies are critical defects that will require time to investigate, said Terry Ann Lowenthal, a former staff director of the House Oversight Census Subcommittee. The counts for groups facilities appear to be way off in some cases, she said. For example, there may have been a prison that showed up as being counted, but with a zero population, or the count of a group quarters was larger than the estimated population for an entire county. Critics of the president's memo say they worry career staff workers at the Bureau are under pressure from Trump political appointees to produce state population counts and a tally of undocumented immigrants while he is still in office regardless of their accuracy. Census employees are working overtime and on weekends, in some cases up to 15 hours a day, and have been pulled off other tasks to try to produce the numbers by early January, according to a person familiar with the situation who described the workers as exhausted and frustrated. House Oversight Committee Chairwoman Carolyn B. Maloney of New York, last week blasted the Bureau for repeatedly canceling or refusing meetings about the status of the census. The committee has scheduled a hearing on the census for Thursday. It is up to the President, after receiving state population counts, to inform Congress within one week of the opening of its next session how its 435 seats are to be allocated. The House Clerk then has 15 days to inform the states of the number of representatives to which each is entitled. It is unclear what would happen if competing sets of numbers are in play during that process. Nobody knows. We haven't thought about this, says Justin Levitt, a constitutional law professor at Loyola Law School in Los Angeles. There haven't ever been fights about, are you just giving us numbers that we're not going to accept? Historically, other attempts to exclude people from being counted for apportionment have failed, said Wolf with the Brennan Center. From the framing to Reconstruction to 230 years of congressional practice, they all show that the answer to this is very simple. All people count. Levitt agreed, saying the only things that are really thorny questions are questions about whether this is the right time or whether plaintiffs have to wait until the president actually takes action. 